Hey guys, um, this is a video on the Inuit in regards to why the Inuit close to the Arctic Circle don't get into ketosis. Let me just share my screen, first of all. This is a video that I just recently did, um, how to tolerate the cold like the Inuit and talking about you know, how they consume a lot of these sort of foods, seafood and stuff like that, which is much higher in taurine, which improves sort of um, the amount of brown adipose tissue and the, the effect of actually being able to generate more endogenous heat into the body, you know, to protect the organs and stuff like that in very cold environments. And so how that helps them so i'll just actually this is a rare footage from wilson wilhelm stefanus and uh just give me a sec i need to add the audio so i'll just stop that be share now we'll just listen to uh, wilhelm stefanus And I had to become a guest of the Eskimos, and for four and a half months, I lived on literally nothing but fish and water. Well, we had some... Uh... He lived on fish and water for four and a half months. He was actually, the people that he was living um, with were people at the tip, the northern sort of tip of uh, Greenland. So we're talking about close to the Arctic Circle. Not talking about the ones that I mentioned in that other video, people who can actually get into ketosis don't have that genetic um, change which prevents them from getting into ketosis. And there's always been sort of views. I had a view about deuterium, um, which was very highly speculative, completely wrong. It was a highly speculative on my side. I've sort of rejected it since then uh, as being a wrong hypothesis. This is a new hypothesis of mine, which I think that is more plausible. I'll go into it shortly, but I just wanted to cover some of the background information first of all. Blubber, some uh, polar bear blubber, but apart mm. from that. And at the end of four and a half months, I was healthier than I'd never been before. I'm enjoying every meal and uh, feeling fine. And this is on an exclusive meat diet. That was exclusive fish in this case. Fish. I have since then spent more than six so yeah as i said earlier um primarily when you're in these sort of colder climates as i showed in that other video um how to tolerate um cold like the inuit i sort of covered that in the same fashion explaining that even the elderly in those regions primarily prioritize seafood fish in that sense in particular, now they do get blubber from whales, from seals, and blubber from polar bears as well. So there's a number of animals that they actually get, and that is what they use for cooking fat and stuff like that, and also providing them, because fish don't have enough fat. So they need to get the fat source from somewhere, and it's pretty much blubber. And blubber is extremely high in long-chain fats not short-chain fatty acids or medium-chain triglycerides in long-chain fats. That's what blubber is. So the long-chain saturated fats. Um, now, they can be converted like the palmitate into ketone um, bodies, you know, so four ketones um, in a 16-carbon length palmitate. But because they've actually got an inhibition, you know, that doesn't happen. So they pretty much oxidize this and also provide, um, you know. And so what they're doing is, so I've actually covered, we've covered that. So that's quite clear. We'll leave it at that. And I'll just continue with my hypothesis. So what my hypothesis now is, which, see, which I believe is more plausible, what is happening is this is an adaptation to an environment where you... Your exit, you, you've, you've got two priorities, one to keep warm and the other 
to basically furnish enough energy without wasting away for your cells. Now, if there is a rate limiting amount of fat that can be exported out of the liver, so if you're exporting out of the liver a certain amount of ketones for your brain, there's going to be less available free fatty acids for the peripheral tissue. So that's going to create a problem because you don't have glucose. Um, you know, you're not eating carbs. So you're dependent on, on fat for both to warm yourself up through the brown adipose tissue. So you've got more brown adipose tissue these people have because they're in a cold environment. So they tend to increase their brown adipose tissue. Like cold thermogenesis, exposing yourself to a lot of cold continuously, you know, like a number of people do um, when they do, you know, cold thermogenesis, you know, all these sort of things, they put their body, they immerse their body in, in the cold and all that. What they do is increase their brown adipose tissue. By doing that, it means that they are able to um, then warm themselves up. It's not only an adaptation, but it's actually forcing the body to increase brown adipose um, fat. We know that quite clearly. There's established research. I don't need to prove anything. You know, you can find it yourselves. So these people are in a cold environment. They're increasing, building, increasing their brown adipose tissue. Now, if on the other hand, they were basically using both the heat themselves and then provide enough energy for the peripheral cells, there wouldn't be enough. There's sort of a rate limiting amount that can actually be exported through VLDL and stuff like that. So if you're actually producing part of it, you're turning it into ketone bodies, and then you're going to have somewhere a bit of a problem. What I think is you're eliminate, by eliminating ketosis, you're able to put more free fatty acid into the system. And also, you're actually also be able to put more um, glycerol, the glycerol backbone into the system. By doing that, you actually then can ramp up gluconeogenesis to provide for the brain because you're not providing ketones. And then the extra, so you're not having to deal with producing ketones as well. You're not putting extra requirement, cellular requirements to produce all these, these this additional fuel. So by, by providing, and also while ketones are a good fuel for the brain, also at the same time is if, you're going to have a problem in a sense in terms of peripheral energy requirements as well. So you're trying to get more energy into the periphery to spare glucose for the brain. You're using ketones when you're in ketosis, but also these people need additional energy for heating their bodies. So what I think is happening is the body had to get, you know, it's a bit like, you know, the expensive tissue hypothesis. You know, something had to give a bigger brain, a smaller gut. Well, something had to give in terms of the energy requirement to keep warm and the energy requirement to maintain sufficient oxidative phosphorylation for the peripheral tissue. So pretty much ketones had to go as a consequence. So I think the reason for this is that the higher requirement to support brain adipose tissue is a more plausible reason why ketosis was eliminated in these people who are closer to the Arctic Circle. It makes more plausible sense to me um, in that regard. You know, I would hope that some scientists would take up the task and look into this and try and and try and actually do some research into this, take like precise measurements of these people to determine whether this hypothesis is valid or not. But it, for me, it makes a lot of sense that uh, by eliminating ketosis, then you're actually providing the body with far more larger quantity of free fatty acids to be able to support both the brown adipose tissue and the peripheral tissue in terms of energy requirements for the peripheral tissue and heating requirements via the um the bat um the brown adipose tissue the brown fat which is you know in this top 
area behind the orcas. So that's my sort of thinking of what drove this genetic change in the Inuit um, to that are close to the Arctic, not all the Inuit, just the ones that are close to the Arctic, um, to downregulate the ability to go into ketosis. Because a lot of people talk about this nonsense. And when I heard Mary Ruddock, who did look into the into the Maasai, they were in a low grade ketosis continuously. She was ta she had taken keto strips with them, with her, and um and also blood glucose strips. And she was actually testing the women, the men, the children, everyone. And it just didn't make sense. It sort of clicked to me, you know, over time. I've been thinking about this and saying, well. These people are in ketosis at a low grade, yes, but are continually more or less in ketosis for most of the time. If it was that bad, you know, being continuously in ketosis, well, even in this low grade, well, why hasn't it been eliminated? You know, obviously, if you eat a lot of meat in one sitting, you can actually, you know, put the brakes on it and stuff like that. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, uh, on the other hand, you know, it doesn't make sense why one population would eliminate that and the other would not if it was a problem. And then again, why the Inuit further away from the Arctic Circle can get, still get into ketosis. While they may have seasonal sugar and all that, um, uh, you know, from but some berries and stuff like that, in the end of the day, that's very little Um uh, you know, in terms of two, in many cases, to knock them out completely out of ketosis. So that doesn't make sense to me at all. And so it, I realised that there had to be something else. And that something else is they need to be able to preserve more, more long-chain fats for the purposes of both providing energy for the peripheral tissue and providing enough for the brown adipose tissue to warm themselves up while using a lot of the glycerol backbone through gluconeogenesis and also probably um, uh, you know, increasing gluconeogenesis not only from the glycerol backbone but also from a lot of the proteins that they're consuming quite a lot of protein, some of the gluconeogenic um, amino acids. So they're covering the energy requirements of the brain and some other tissue like the red blood cells and stuff like that, but at the on on the other side, the they are able to spare the extra, um, you know, long chain fats from being turned into ketones, but providing that to the brown adipose tissue. That makes more sense to me than any other theory that I've heard up to up to now. That's my theory. That's a hypothesis that I'm putting forward to the carnivore community and to many others. Um, you know, I say to people, challenge me, prove me wrong. Tell me why um, a different idea would be more plausible than the one that I've presented. You know, I'll I'll accept if, you know, if, I've, um, if I'm wrong, I'll accept, you know, a stronger argument. But up until now, I really haven't heard of a strong argument why um, those people that are closer to the Arctic would have eliminated the capacity to go into ketosis. So that's pretty much it, the hypothesis. There is no science out there. There is no research. I'm putting a, a hypothesis that I think is plausible. Um, and I challenge anyone to prove me wrong or to put up something even better that, it, that has stronger legs. Because up until now, I have not seen anything that has strong legs. Anyway, see you.